forces and Newton's laws are usually something that people have seen a lot of times, uh, but an understanding of it's still really important on your exams. So I really like that. Uh, may the mass times acceleration be with you, because I hope you know that's why it's force, especially with these days of Star Wars movies coming out some more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about free body diagrams. I think that's maybe something really important. Uh, you want to add up all the vectors to figure out the net force. And I put an F with a little subscript net. So for example, uh, I mean this. It just doesn't turn out all that nicely with the way I wrote it. So it's like this F with a little subscript net. What that means, that's the result of adding all the different vectors up. So let's just say um, you know, there's a force acting on me this way. And there's a force acting on me also this way. If the two forces are equal and opposite, you know, I am getting a force one way, I am getting a force the other way, and yet if they're equal and opposite, let's say they're both two newtons, so one new, uh, two newton that way, two newton that way, the end result is going to be zero in this case. So therefore, the F net equals zero. And if net equals zero, here's what happens. It's really, really important that you understand this. There's no acceleration. This is the key thing here. Whoops, I can't even spell apparently. X. Oh, God, really bad at writing here today. Acceleration. This is the key thing here. If there's no net force, there's no acceleration. You can still be in motion. This is the key thing. So let's just say I have these force this way, this force this way. I mean, yeah, I have no acceleration. That's because in this case, I'm still. But what if I was, uh, you know, driving in my car? I might have a forward force caused by the engine, you know, from the sort of thrust or the sort of the forward uh, action of the engine, but I might also have, you know, the backwards result of all the friction. And if the net force is zero, it just means the vectors are canceling out. You can have it uh, canceling out up and down as well. For example, right now, as I speak to you, I'm sitting in a chair and my bum is actually having a force going downwards because of gravity. Uh, but the chair is also giving me an upwards force. It's called the normal force, the reaction force. And this one is exactly equal to my um, downwards force. Therefore, I'm not accelerating up or down, right? I'm not like flying down or up or whatever. So just keep in mind, you could still be moving um, and have no acceleration. Just means constant motion or you could be zero. Uh, this is an example. I saw this show up on an exam before on a paper one, actually. So for example, three different forces. So here, let's just say you get different forces. So two newtons, seven newtons, four newtons, and they act on you. And here you're not told which way they act, which means, you know, you might have the two newton this way. You could have the seven newton, you know, going that way, you know, for example. Uh, then you can have, you know, the four newton maybe acting that way. Let's just say. If that was the case, then what's the maximum? Uh, uh, let's just say that was four. Let's just say I added up these ones, just the way I drew it. I would have uh, two plus four, they're both in sort of one direction, so that gives me six in one direction. I have seven in the other direction, so seven minus six, I end up with a result of one newton, you know, that way in this case, or one newton to the right. Um, in this example here, we have two newtons, seven newtons, and four newtons. What's the maximum resultant force you could have? Well, in this case, the maximum you could have is if you had them each on top of each other. In other words, you had the two newtons, then the seven newtons, let's just say, and then the four newtons. It doesn't matter which order you do them, right? Uh, as long as you add up all three of the vectors in the same direction, uh, that's the maximum you can have, right? This plus this plus this. In this case here, seven plus two is nine. 9 plus 4 is 13, so that would be the maximum uh, force you could have. Keep in mind, you see it could be anything else. Though. You see in this case, I was able to make it 1 Newton by going 7 to the left and 2 to the right and 4 to the right. So all these different combinations are possible. It just depends how you arrange them. Uh, let's go maybe quickly through equilibrium. So equilibrium is what happens when the resultant force is zero. Just what I showed you before. So if the result is force is zero, you are in equilibrium, you can still be moving. An example of that, like I said, with a car, well, we could also do the same idea with a plane, for example. So right now on this plane right here has an upwards force, uh, probably due to lift, has a downwards force uh, due to its weight, so uh, we could say gravity. It's gonna have a forward force, we call that thrust. We often call that that, at least in aviation. Uh, and it'll have a backwards force, we call that one F drag. And if it is not accelerating, it means the lift force and the gravity force are equal and opposite, they're canceled out. And the forward thrust and the backwards drag caused by air resistance, you know, because it's going through the air, they're all canceling each other out. Now that doesn't mean your plane falls out of the sky, right? It just means you're not accelerating. 
Okay, so the, we'll say that again. So no acceleration. That was the key thing here. Um, this is important, like, you know, when you're in an airplane, for example, and they tell you at some point after you reach cruising altitude and they say, everybody's free to move around the cabin. Uh, that's usually when you've, you know, there's no more extra forces on you. So there's no more uh, unbalanced forces, you could say. So that's why then it's safe to just walk around inside the airplane. But when you're taking off, for example, you can have more thrust and drag. So, you know, you're really feeling an acceleration. They don't want people walking around. Then people can fall and get hurt and all that. Uh, Newton's first law. Um, this is just one way of writing it, but an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Um, whoops, I actually wrote this kind of wrong, didn't I? Yeah, I'll have to uh, take that out here. Uh, I'm going to remove this piece right here, actually. I'm just going to say object. Object in motion tends to stay in motion as well, right? I'll just realize I have made a mistake. That's okay. Object in motion tends to stay in motion. That's the key one there, too. Now, what I mean by this, it sounds really simple, and yet you really need to understand this to answer some of the uh, exam questions. So, for example, um, if you're at rest, you're going to stay at rest unless you're acted on by an external unbalanced force. In other words, that unbalanced force, that's this F net. This is the unbalanced force. So if there is a net force, then you will cause this object that was at rest to not be at rest. Or just like if you have an object in motion, like that airplane, uh, if you apply an unbalanced force, so in other words, if there is a net force, then it will uh, change its motion in some way. Um, this becomes very important for all sorts of examples, like a cyclist, for example. Can you imagine if you're biking and you're about to strike this uh, you know, big obstacle here? As soon as you reach that obstacle here, I mean, here's your bike, right? So, I mean, there's your bike, after you hit it, and you basically, you go flying. Now, why do you go flying? That's because you and the bike initially were going in one direction, but what happens is when you hit this thing, the bike stops suddenly, but because you are a separate physics object, you are a separate object, you weren't tied to your bike. Therefore, when the bike stops, you're an object in motion, so you tend to stay in motion. So you're gonna go in a linear, so you're gonna to try to just keep going straight. Obviously, gravity then gets you. That's why you keep going flying. Uh, like this example here from Seinfeld, you bought a ketchup bottle. Did you know actually that uh, there is an efficient way to actually um, get the ketchup out of a ketchup bottle? If you try to hit the ketchup bottle from the top like that, that's really stupid. It turns out you're not using Newton's first law correctly. Uh, one of the best ways, imagine this is your ketchup bottle. Imagine my pen here is a ketchup bottle, okay? Put it at a roughly 45 degree angle. And what you should do is you should get the ketchup and the bottle, both of them going in one direction. So for example, let's just say you bring them down this way and bring your hand there to stop it suddenly. So if you go bang, you stop it. You're basically doing what the bike did. Imagine this, the bottle and the ketchup are two separate physics objects. And as you stop the bottle, the bottle stops suddenly, but the ketchup wants to keep going. So if you just go bang, bang like this right here, usually the ketchup comes out right away. 45 degree angle, go bang like this, does it. Although, of course, a lot of ketchup bottles now are just squeeze ones, so who cares? Seat belts are really important as well. Uh, that's why you want to be strapped into your car. Again, imagine this. You're driving in your car. You and the car are separate physics objects if you're not tied together. If the car runs into something and you, you know, hit something, the car stops suddenly. You keep going. So it's not like, I mean, it's not like you fly through the window, you know, it's that the car stops, you just keep going and the window happens to be in your way. That's why, you know, bad things happen. So you do want to be strapped into your car. You want to be part of the physics. Uh, we have Newton's second law. That's a really important one. That one has some equations for it in your data booklet. We've got F equals MA. That's the more famous um, way of writing it. Um, but there's actually a better way. There's a more complete way. This is a force. This is a, uh, sorry, a vector. Force is a vector, acceleration is a vector. Most people know F equals MA. They like that dumb joke with the um, Star Wars, right? May the force, which is mass times acceleration, be with you. So if we do this one right here, we've also got another version that says that force is also the change in momentum over time. So P is momentum in kilogram meters per second, T is the time, F is the force. And we also have A is acceleration and M is the mass. So we have an example here. So let's just say I'm pulled by a, uh, by the way, uh, oh, I really wanted to point this out. Really important. This right here is F net. In other words, this is your unbalanced force. This one here is really, really important. 
So here in this example, I have that uh, I'm pulled by a velociraptor. Uh, so in this case, maybe like this, it's a ridiculous situation, but there we go. I just drew a little man here like this. You can see I'm not an artist. But the raptor's force on me is 52 newtons to the right. We're going to assume it's not on an angle. We'll make it really nice and simple, okay? So the force on me is 52 newtons to the right. Uh, but there's a friction force, right? Because I'm dragging on the ground, there's a friction force. In this case, it's going to act opposite to the motion. In this case, it's going to be 12 newtons acting on me to the left. Friction always opposes the motion, so I'll draw a shorter looking one, you know, because it's supposed to be less. You could do it to scale, of course, but I'm being really sloppy here. Basically, I, I'm given the mass, um, I'm told, you're told that I'm at rest. How long will it take me to travel one kilometer? So in other words, I'm still right here, uh, and away I go. It's not exactly, this example is a little bit uh, poor, because if I was initially at rest, I wouldn't have any friction force acting on me, but let's let's just calculate these. This will be to do with friction, and then you can actually calculate with the dynamic and static friction. Uh, but we're going to be a lot simpler here. We'll just ignore the dynamic and static friction components and just figure out this net result here. So in this case here, I have to figure out my net force. What happens when I add up my two vectors? If I add my 52 net, uh, newtons vector to the right with the 12 newton vector to the left, I add them up. In this case, I have to subtract that one. So 52 minus 12, what's that? That should be 30, isn't it? Nope, sorry, 40. 40 newtons. And which way is it acting? It's to the right. So because of that, now that's my F net. So now I know that F net is going to be equal to MA. So that's going to tell me my acceleration. So now I know my acceleration is going to be F net over M. So in this case here, my net force is going to be 40 newtons. Uh, yup, 40 newtons divided by my mass, which is 75 kilograms. Let me just work that out. Uh, so let me see here. So I've got 40 over 75. I've got my acceleration, which is 0 0.533 meters per second squared. This is my acceleration. I'm going to need this. Now, if I'm initially at rest, how long does it take to travel some distance? Ah, this is just an acceleration problem. This isn't so bad at all. So what I'm going to do then is just to deal with it as that. So acceleration. So I'm going to do U, V, A, S, T. It's in 1D, so it's super easy. There's no two dimensions to worry about. My initial speed is going to be zero. My final speed, uh, I don't know it. I know my acceleration now is 0.533. My displacement, ah, I know that. It's a thousand meters. And my time, ah, that's what I need to know. I need to know how long does it take me to travel one kilometer, accelerating at a constant acceleration of this. So if I look at this right here, then I need to take an equation it has a T in it that um, doesn't have any V's in it. And let's see if I can figure out which uh, one to do. So can you remember which equations that you have um, from your data booklet? Can you remember or maybe look it up? Because uh, you can actually do it. Um, you'll see that, uh, which one should I use? I should use um, S equals UT plus half AT squared. I think that'll work because I don't have a V. That'll work. And U is zero. That makes it really nice and easy. So now I have, um, I want to solve for T. So I can take my 2 and multiply it by the S. So I can say 2S equals, uh, oh, 2S over A. That equals T squared. So that means t is going to be plus or minus the square root of this. So I just need to put those numbers in. So I have 2 times my displacement, which is 1,000. All that divided by 0 0.533. Take the square root of that. I'll do that on my trusty old calculator here. Let's see if I can do it. So it's 2,000 divided by 0.533. Take that, square root it. And I get that the time is about 61.256 seconds. I need to think about how many digits can I use. I can use two digits to write it. So I'll just say t equals, in this case, just 61. Oops, maybe I'll write it over here so you can see better. So I'll say uh, t equals 61, sec uh, 61 seconds. There we go. We've solved it. Now, um, Newton's third law is really nice and straightforward. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You just got to think about which is your action and reaction pair. What this means is if you, let's say you're standing on a skateboard by a wall and you push to the left onto the wall, what happens? The wall technically pushes back. That's why you push to the left and uh, you actually end up going to the right, don't you? Just like jumping, think about it carefully. How do you jump? 
I mean, I have a four-year-old daughter. She doesn't think about jumping. She just knows how to do it, right? She doesn't know physics. She doesn't care. She already knows how to jump, doesn't she? Don't you? To jump, you have to push your legs down. Isn't that kind of weird? Think about it. You push your legs down, but that's because you know, without thinking about it, Newton's third law. If you push down against the earth, technically the earth will push up against you. That's why you'll jump. Same with a rocket. I love this Photoshop of a cat. <laughs> it's like he's farting or something, but this is how it works in space, right? If you're going to eject a bunch of gases out of a rocket one way, uh, then Newton's third law says that you will get a opposite reaction. You get a force to that way. That's how come you can actually have a rocket and actually have its engine work in space when there's no air. Some people originally thought, ah, because there's nothing in space, you won't be able to have propulsion. You won't be able to move around in space. But Newton's third law says, oh, absolutely. It's the key thing for moving around in space. Throw something one way, you go the other way. So all you got to do in a spaceship, throw a bunch of stuff one way, and you go that way. It's really simple.